Welcome to Let Me Ask You This. I'm your host, Tom. Thank you for joining me while I interview individuals about their life and their experience. If you like this show, please make sure you subscribe and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. I hope you enjoy the show. So, I don't. So, the only thing I edit is... Is this? So the only thing I edit is I take the audio from this, cut that audio out, and put it over. Okay. And then it's just live. What do you use to do that? Uh, I use iMovie. Okay. So I record so you got a with a, uh, GarageBand. Yeah. And then it's just a regular iPhone. iPhone. Yep. And then... <clears throat> And then yeah, just iMovie. Okay. This was my last episode. Uh, I was in basic with him. Oh yeah. Yeah. Split screen. You guys are, in, or you're in the same place. Uh, Zoom. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For people that are out of state, that's what I do. I prefer to do in person. Sure. It's more personal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can, it's easier to feed off each other. Timing is much easier. Don't cut over each other. And with Zoom, it even after it like goes through and makes everything, it it analyzes it and make it better. Yeah, it's built in studio editing. Let's yeah. Let's see what we're looking at here. And so, pretty much, even then, it still skips a little bit. With this, it's more fluid. Fucking, I do it. Yeah, I love it. All right. This is my first time with two microphones. Okay. Billy set it up for me, <clears throat> finally. He knows how to do that stuff, too? Yeah. What's he doing with that stuff? Just from gaming and shit? No, so he wanted to get into podcasting. He's the one. So I've always wanted to like take that step forward, mm-hmm. but I just didn't know how. And Billy and Chris, Amber's husband... Um, they started a podcast called County Women Sheep. And I was going to have a segment interviewing people. And it was going to be called, let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. And I, they stopped doing their podcast. And I recorded one thing for them. And that was my first episode of Let Me Ask You This. And it was with UFC fighter um, Ricky Simmon. Nice. It was in Djibouti, Africa. They were doing a tour Fighting for Freedom. Yeah. Great name. Yeah. And <clears throat> my buddy, he got to roll with him. So I wasn't rolling. I I don't really know Jiu-Jitsu too much. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I didn't no, want to hurt myself. Yeah. And so we were all talking. And I was like, hey, you want to do an interview? And he was like, I'm in Africa. I'm not doing anything else. So yeah. he's, well, we stood up and did a 10, 15 minute interview. And that's kind of how this all snowballed and started. Fuck can I do? Yeah. Um, mute button. Is there a mute button on this? Yeah, so if you press that, it flashes. You're muted. Okay. Not muted. Okay. <clears throat> Just because if I got to clear. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> all right. Let's put this right there. Episode 26. Nice. Yeah. It's... I got... One more interview after you. Not today. Yeah? Um, Who you got? So, her name is Dominique. She is a comedian. And I went to high school with her. And I posted on Facebook the other day. And I was like, anybody know any comedians? Um, I've been listening to a lot of comedians lately. And it sounds really Fred. Weird. Sorry. Um, It sounds really weird. But they... The comedians have a sense of humor that I like. Because they're raw. Uh, it's they have no filter. Right. And we all know that it's jokes. And jokes not are okay. All of us. Yeah, not all. Not of us. all of us know. But like the comedians. Like yeah. it's okay to joke around. And so I'm trying to surround myself with more of those type of people. Smart man. And because th- that's the type of people I want to be around. Yep. So I found a foot in and I'm gonna see if I can 
See what I can do. Let it rock. Yeah. Fuck. Are you enjoying yourself? I'm loving it. That's all that matters. Oh, yes. Like, you don't need to pay the bills with it. None of that right now. Like, just enjoy it. Start to learn the craft. Oh, yeah. And that's what I'm doing. You and me both, kid. Like, fucking twice. What do I know? <laughs> I got a phone, too, with a stand. I'm like, hey, you want to talk? People are like, yeah, all right. Let's do it. Yeah. So. You you don't edit it either, do you? Uh, yeah, some of the stuff I do. Because, I mean, I'll talk to people for like an hour and a half sometimes. You mm-hmm. know, you get me going about wrestling. I'll fucking... Blah, 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 blah. And so... Most people's attention span can't go that long. Yeah. So what I do is I chop it up and I'll do like, I know we're on a certain subject. Yeah. So I'll like chop that up and put that out as like a five minute clip. And And I release the whole episode. So if somebody wants to listen to everything, like the whole hour, hour and a half, whatever it is, 40 minutes, sometimes like I I go till I'm done. Yeah. And again... I think that interesting. So not everybody wants to fucking like listen that long. Or they don't like attention span, right? Give me a fi- me too. If I see a five minute clip versus a fifty minute clip while I'm just fucking around, yeah, I'm gonna go to the five minute clip. Yeah, I don't have time for fifty minutes. But if you get me with that five minute clip, I'll go check the rest of it out. That's very true. So that's, we, that's my approach, especially if it's a good summary. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. again, like in an hour video. Mm-hmm. Like, I can get out, like, 15 minutes of, like, real good shit. Just, yeah. to, just to package up, like, here's three, five minutes out of there. And then that, that's what I find. Like, for me, like, I brought the Wisconsin coaches on. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, shit, Division One coaches, people will fucking love that. They didn't really get that many views. Hmm. People didn't really give a fuck about They don't know them. They know me. Yeah, and, and I talk to you know me, dude. I talk to everybody at the tournaments. I'm like, I'm always a. I, I, I love it. It's great. Yeah, so like, I people are like, hey, you want to fucking rap? They're like, yeah, but the videos that I get a lot of the views on are the ones that I'm in, doing the shit that I'm talking about. People want to hear some things that I got to say about wrestling and what we're doing. So, it took me a while to be able to say that out loud because that would be sounding, you know, that whole it makes egoic sense. conceited thing, but. I'm okay with the fact that there's people out there that like what I got to say. Yeah. You know, and there's other people, not so much. And you also got to look at the demographic of where you are. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember being out. Should like we do this middle. on the, because this is good shit. Should we do this on the um, camera? Like uh, Everything's recording. Oh, right now? Oh, oh yeah. Oh, shit. Oh, we're rolling. Yeah. Well, yeah we, nobody we, told me. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can Freestyle. like cut up a. It's all good, like, yeah, but nope, It's all good. Yeah, it's. I won't talk about Rick Ross then. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, with with wrestling in the Midwest, it's huge. Oh yeah! Like I saw billboards for wrestling out there, like for high school. You don't get that here. Nope. And not yet. Yeah, not yet. It's possible. And it's just crazy because I remember even when I was in middle school when I went to Ohio, eighth graders were cutting weight to like wrestle there. Mm-hmm. And when I heard that, I was mind blown. I was like, you're, you're in eighth grade. You shouldn't be doing this. Mm-hmm. This is terrible for you. Oh, yeah. And we had <laughs> people that look like me now that like I was wrestling. And it was, ooh, it was scary. It's a, it's a different culture. You oh, know, yes. Like different parts of the, uh, the country. You know, like you go to Texas and the football scene down there. It's ridiculous. I mean, mm-hmm. Pop Warner is very competitive. It's a different level. Yeah. And what I've noticed, like, so... Like, you and I met through the Y. Yes. Like you were a wrestler, and I was coming in as a first-year coach. And I remember at the end of the year, the very first state tournament that I ever went to in in um, youth wrestling as a coach, I remember at the weigh-ins, there was some like kid, he's like eight, nine years old. He's naked on the scale. And I'm like, I look at Rick, and I'm like, Rick Ross. I'm <laughs> like, is, is that allowed? He's like, no. I'm like, should we say something to somebody? He's like, yeah. Like, you got to talk to the... It's a culture shift, right? Oh, yeah. And so what I've learned is, is like, being in the sport for as long as I've been in it now, um, you're never going to regulate or govern out competitive nature of parents. No. Because it ain't the kid who's trying to cut weight. Oh, they have no idea what they're doing. Right. It's the parents that are generating the interest in it. And, uh, you know, right now, I know on the youth level, I got a pretty good push with uh the middle school board. So I'm president of the middle school board here in, in New Hampshire and got a great group of people, mm-hmm. you know, Rick Ross and, uh, and his, his people, they got it started and they kept it going for a long time and, you know, cycle of life. Yep. And so now what's happening is, is looking at different ways to do things, right? Yep. 
numbers for sports across the board in high school specifically, but also youth level, they're all down. You know, it's not one thing that has the numbers down. It's a, it's a plethora of things. Number one, there's far more options, right? So wrestling back in the day used to be people who couldn't make the basketball team. <laughs> yeah. You know, like yeah. in, in New Hampshire at least, right? Yep. And so if you didn't make the basketball team, you didn't want to run track, well, guess what? You're going to go wrestle because you're going to do something. There were no phones. There was none of that stuff. Yeah, go look playing hockey. Right. Co- not cost effective for a lot yeah. of families, you know? That's a pretty big investment as mm-hmm. a hockey player. And so... Now, like just in our pockets, we have access to the world, right? In the form of our phone and oh, tablets, yes. you know? So there's a lot of things out there that will keep kids' attention for a long period of time mm-hmm. that doesn't have them starving themselves and pushing their physical limits. And so what would it look like if as a community we shifted some things with the intention of growing the sport? So right now, numbers are down. So what should be the main focus? Well, grow in the numbers. Yeah. So what's what's the best way to do that? All cards on the table? I don't know. Here's what I know. I got some ideas. And some people that I respect, and I've labeled them as intelligent people just based on my interactions with them, they seem to agree. And so, like, how do we we enroll, like, think about it on the K through 4 level. How do we enroll that crowd to stay in the game? Like to stay wrestling. So, because my thing as a coach is, is I want to, I believe in the sport so much and the life lessons that comes with it Mm -hmm. that like I always think like get them to high school because that's like where the real lessons are going to be learned. Win, lose, or draw, just everything as a whole going in. You got puberty happening, you know, guys and girls like dating, all that, all the extra stuff that comes in high school, getting a job, making some money, and doing all those kinds of things. So, what's it look like? to on the lower level nurture them and what that looks like to me is this don't keep parents in the gym for five hours yes how do you compete with five hours in a gym to see your kid wrestle twice and then you got you know flag football or whatever else goes on basketball in in the winter right Mm -hmm. where you're in the gym for an hour and you're done you can go to your kids football game on the other side you can go take care of your your Saturday duties but like we ask parents to be in the gym all day Sunday yeah and that's not just the hardcores that's all of them the hardcores are going to stay in the gym and compete they're going to find their tournaments how do we build the the smaller community the K through 4 regular Joes and Joettes that can grow the sport and like I'm of the opinion that K through 4 we don't need tournaments I know that's going to make a lot of people really pissed off no it makes sense what would it look like? And I don't know. I know you've been away from um, high school, by the way. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that's that surfaced around here, and I'm actually going to be talking to the gentleman who runs it, um, I think later this week, is this thing called War Zone. And think about like an open mat. Okay. It's like a it's like a fancy open mat. And what it does is is it groups kids together with similar ability, and. Basically, like, so if you're in the 60-pound weight bracket, right, and mm-hmm. there's a youth tournament, 60 pounds, you go there, and in an hour to an hour and a half, you can have five, six matches. Many matches as you'd like. The more you wrestle, the more points you get. That would be amazing. I've been to one of them where I was coaching, and it was mm-hmm. really cool. The environment was a lot less relax, or less stress, right? A lot mm-hmm. less yelling and rah, those individual tournaments. Um, kids were leaving there with a smile. So were the parents. And it's not just on a lower level. So there was a war zone event here a couple of weeks ago. And high school people that I know, they, like, they loved it. Kid was, you know, you get high school kids, 16, 17 years. He drove himself there. He had three tough matches because they group you by quality. Yeah. So it was none of this 12-second pin and leave just because you're the number one seed and you got to have some fish to smash in the way. It was beautiful. So how did they rank it? So it's over time. So the more that you're in the system... It, there's an algorithm, and again, yeah. I'm going to find out a lot more of this information um, this week. But like, the concept makes a lot of sense to me. Oh, it does. It, it gets us in and out. Mm-hmm. Like on a Sunday, you might have a kid that's got a, a afternoon football game. You don't even know if you're going to be there because, well, we're going to we're going to weigh in at seven. We're going to sit around for five hours, and then the middle school will go. Yeah, that was one of my least favorite thing about tournaments was I would wake up at four thirty in the morning. In, like, elementary school to go weigh in. 
And then maybe nap on the way. I'm in elementary school. I'm probably cranky. Like, I'm screaming. I'm annoying. And then I weigh in. And then maybe take a nap. Most of the time. High school, I took a nap. Yeah. Yeah, I got that down. Yeah. But as an elementary schooler, it was hell. It It's a long day. Especially for somebody that has somebody else wrestling in middle school. Mm-hmm. Like me. Right. So, because I had my sister and my brother both wrestling at the same time as me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, you know, some people might not know this, but you basically learned how to walk on a mat. I believe my mother has said, I've taken my first steps on the mat. Yeah. 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 So, like, it was, I was around it my whole life. And even then, it was still draining just being in a gym all day. By the end of the day, you're exhausted, and not only that, you don't eat the greatest. They they don't have healthy food at these tournaments. No. You, pizza. Um, easy and cheap. Yeah, easy and cheap. You know, we've we've run a few tournaments together. Yep. Easy and cheap, right? Get, get the masses fed. Um, and again, I think that there's a space for, for the individual tournaments. Yeah. Right? So, like, what I would love to see... And again, it, it might be radical, but I think right now, like what we're what we're doing isn't working. I don't know the answer. I just know we get to try something. So I'm gonna yeah. throw something out there. So what would it look like if we did K through four, right? Mm-hmm. Every Sunday that there's a tournament, instead of weighing them in and bracketing them and doing all that stuff, do an informal war zone. Nobody has to pay anything to get in there, like because I know there's fundraisers and all that. But like, what's it look like just to give the K through four kids like? You can go have an open mat for two hours. So you know as a parent, for two hours, if my kid wants to be there for two hours, they can be there for two hours. And they do their two hours, they wrestle, and they go home. What about if you only want to do an hour? Cool. Do an hour and head out because you got to go to your other kid's game. Yeah. Options. Instead of just sitting there waiting for people to bracket. And it's not like we... Things are getting better, right? we got Flow yeah. Wrestling yeah, at a lot of the tournaments. New Hampshire Way has done a, a great job in, in upping the quality of tournaments around here. And, you know, the first time this year we're going to have... Um, you know, not, not for the first time, but in, in a long time, we're going to have what I think will be a meaningful state tournament on the youth level, as meaningful as a youth tournament can get. Okay. And so I just think that like, we talk about the K-4, right? That's enrolling the parents. Yeah. So let's go to the other side of that spectrum. Let's talk about high school kids. Hmm. Do you think that they want to sit in the gym for 12, 13 hours? Because oh, no. during wrestling season... There's nothing else you can do. School, mm-hmm. and if you want to, if you're if you're a committed athlete, wrestling. Yeah. Right, and now you still have some of these old school coaches that they'll have a kid that's not that good. He's gonna cut weight just because he can fit in the lineup. You yeah. got football coaches that push their kids away from the sport because they spend all spring and fall building them up, mm-hmm. and then in the winter, coaches are having them sucked down. And I'm saying to myself, for what? Like just for the, just Thoughts. for the competitive edge right now. Like, how is that doing our sport? Right. They don't think about that. They don't think about the future. And I hate to say it, I was a product of that in high school. Um, instead of it was he didn't tell me to cut weight. I chose to. Um, but, it's the culture. Yeah, it's the culture. I didn't want to be JV, and I wanted that competitive edge. Mm-hmm. I was naturally one thirty. And then I would basically starve myself to get down to 126. I caught 10 pounds in one day, one day. Mm-hmm. It was terrible. Yep. It was right after Christmas. It was full of all. I will never forget that. Mm-hmm. And when you think about, like, for what? Like, at that point, were you going to win level? No, I injured myself cutting weight. Right? And so, again, again <clears throat> it would be one thing if we were managing weight. Yep. Not cutting weight. And I remember uh, I remember I, I went with, uh, with my son Jesse. We went to a wrestling tournament out in New York. And we drove out there. And we get there. And kid I know is a super good wrestler. You know, well, they're kids, so I'll leave their names out of it. Yeah. But, um, super good wrestler. Super talented. And I'm looking at him right before he weighs in. And he's gone. P.S. The kid is 11 years old, just for the record gaunt like just like you could tell like 
people who are cutting weight have a very decisive look about like unhealthy right? until weigh-ins and then they chug a gallon of water in oh i wish <laughs> because here's what what happened after that poor kid weighed in you know what he's you know what he put in his body gatorade and ice cream so he dehydrated his body down mm-hmm. and filled it up with shit yep that's terrible Who, the but who's that... driving that it's not the kid no it's the parents uh-huh and the youth coaches yeah. The youth definitely. coaches that are like, like, no, you're not cutting that weight. If you're that tough, wrestle this weight class. Yeah. What, but your team's got to win. No, 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 no. Because those kids that are doing that, a lot of them will burn out before they get to high school. They're like, no, I'm good. Because everything about cutting weight, while there's some value in, in like, I know this. When I cut weight, like, it builds character in, in a strange, odd way. Like, suffering always does. Yeah. Do we need to do it that way? When when it's no. at the most crucial time no. for a lot of these kids, no. where they're 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 like their endocrine systems, like everything is going to reject that. It's human nature to like, oh, you want to lose weight? No, we're going to pack it on, because survival. Yeah. How does it pack it on? It doesn't pack it on in muscle. No. Nope. It's going to pack it on as fat. And what happens to a lot of these kids? And I, I remember kids that I went to high school with, like. I'm still pretty close to, like, when I walked in my senior year, I weighed 165 pounds. I wrestled at 135 pounds. Reason being, because my coach said that's where I was going to go. And my coach was an amazing coach. He's a very honorable man, and he did the best he could at that time. But that wasn't that wasn't the best thing. No. Even though I had a successful senior year, all that good stuff. Like, again, not taking away the results of anybody or, or how they do it, and not even saying it's wrong. Just saying, does it grow the sport? No, it doesn't. And the the thing about cutting weight, it's not good no matter how old you are. So even like if you look at the UFC, for the people who watch UFC more than wrestling, how little break weight brackets they have. Mm-hmm. It's terrible. You, It's about 10, 15 pounds between each weight bracket. Throw one in between each one. Like there's no need to be cutting that much weight. Right. Like... Three, four pounds, maybe five. Like, that's water weight. That's go for a decent run and not drink water. Like, that's a bad, but I can, I fluctuate five pounds on a day-to-day base. Every human does, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, I don't see that. Like, even, even in high school, maybe add more weight brackets because it's, it'd be healthier. Well, see, the problem, though, is, is or not problem, but one of the challenges, right? Right now, okay. in New Hampshire, we can't fill a dual meet roster. Like, the, yeah. the number of quality duels in the state of New Hampshire right now, it's under, under five. Like, that's actually, like, a quality, like, competitive, down to the, like, match. Like, there's only a few of them. You can name them. Like, when Merrimack and Bishop Girton get together, right? Like, in Division Two. Okay. Like that's a that's a big one. They're always yep. competitive. They're like the two best in D two, right? You go to D one, right? Timberlane. How is it we have? And again, I'm not a Timberlane hater, <laughs> at all. Like, but how is it we have one program that's just reigned supreme over the state for 25, 30 years? I, I just find it hard to to believe that the rest of the state is that far behind. And if so, like, what are they share doing? share the secrets of like your success with the rest of the state because a competitive state. Is a good state. So, like, how do we, how do we break down the silos that coaches built, so that we can be competitive and yet work together as a community? So, with that, what I think, I don't understand why somebody would hide a secret like that, like how to build up their program so well. Because dig deep. What do you think it's about? It's about winning, one hundred percent. But where's the satisfaction in winning? If there's no competition. That's my outlook on it. If I show up, like when I was in, when I was wrestling, if I showed up and I just walked out in 30 seconds because I wrestled all fish, I'm not satisfied. I'm annoyed. I'm like, I came here to wrestle and there's no wrestling. Now, like, the other side of that, though, you had parents that wouldn't let you walk off the mat after beating up, you know, kids that have wrestled for a year or two and you're on your ninth or tenth year. Your parents, how they raised you, didn't allow you to be in that space, to, to gloat 
after you beat people you're supposed to beat. Yeah. Not everybody has those parents. And coaches are those people as well. They don't have parents that taught them that. Competition, man, there's a fine line between being a good sport and being a cheat. Wrestling taught me so many lessons without even like knowing they taught me lessons. It was crazy. And that's why I'm like not even like just wrestling, just sports in general. Because I learned so many lessons from football that I wouldn't have learned from wrestling mm-hmm. that apply to day to day life with different types of struggle. And it's sports just in general are a different machine and it's it's weird that more kids don't do it and it's because of the technology that we have and parents don't parents are in the gym too much but they're also not at the same time because parents will just let their kids sit here and play the playstation for five six hours and be okay with it but then not be like hey go outside and play like i used to get yelled at to go outside and play all the time yeah well i mean i hear what you're saying and i just i guess i would invite you to look at like there are different kinds of parents out there and you oh, got yeah. some old school parents yes. you know like they remember the like hey the lights are on that's when you come home kind of thing go have some fun and enjoy the day mm-hmm. and like be part of the community and all there's a lot of good lessons that your that your folks taught you but that's not always the case oh i know so how do we you know, and again, you went to Central here in, in Manchester, and like that's considered our inner city school, right? Mm-hmm. And so, a lot of the kids there, they they don't have that stability at home. You know, sometimes the only time they're eating is when they're at school, and th- there's all sorts of things to consider. And you know, one thing I don't see from the coaches on the high school level specifically is compassion. Like, it's not all about wrestling. Are you thinking about like what's going on with that kid at home? You know, and. I remember on the youth level, I had a great experience with um, learning. <laughs> Shocker. So I was coaching this kid, and my, my style when I first started coaching was aggression. Like, just not even aggression, but just super passionate and like, mm-hmm. rah, you were oh, I remember. Yeah, like a fucking maniac. And over the years, I've kind of adapted my approach. And part of that was due to a, a good friend of mine, Tom Back, who coached with me for many years. He put me aside one time. We were talking about some other things. He goes, hey, you're going to lose that kid. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, just pay attention. Like when, when you go to him, just watch how he kind of cowers down a little bit. And he's just, he's almost like submissive in the sense. And it rang true because what I knew about that kid was his dad was a maniac. <laughs> like, and once, once Tom pointed that out to me, it's like when you get a new car. You didn't see him at all until you buy that new car. Now you see it everywhere. Yeah. And when he pointed that out, I just looked and I'm like, wow, wow. Like, I don't want to be like that with that kid. I don't want that kid to come to practice and fear me yelling at him. Not for fear of like, oh, he's, but why do I got to yell to get my point across? You know what I've learned, Thomas? I get my point across so much better with kids, adults, people, when I'm not yelling at them. Because when you're yelling, they're not focusing on what you're saying. Mm -hmm. They're focusing on... How you're coming at them. They're in fight or flight. Yes. Like, I either got to fight this or I, I put my shoulders up and I just I, I fly away. Whether that's just take the the verbal abuse on that level and then get away from it as soon as I can. Mm-hmm. Or is I got to fight it? No, you're wrong. And it's like, I don't need to be like that. Not with kids. Like, not with adults. Like, again, I'm not saying there's not a time. You can't be at boot camp and be like, listen, do you mind going for a run? <laughs> But these kids aren't training for for war. No. They're just they're training for a tournament. The ones that want to go to the military, there's a reason wrestlers are like the number one looked for, sought after athlete to go to the military. And it's not because they can get yelled at good. It's because of all the other stuff that that we did as wrestlers that we watch other kids do as wrestlers now. It's the I don't want this anymore and I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. But my goal matters more to me than to have this water right now. I can wait another hour to get on the scale. While all my my buddies are off doing this, doing that. You know what I'm going to be doing? I'm going to go for a run so I can hit weight. And on Saturday, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to work my craft for you know eight hours out of the day. I'm going to I'm going to basically get in four yeah. to five fights with friends. Mm-hmm. 
I'm gonna leave, like bruise all of that. Like we see kids that have wrapped up. Like it's brutal. It's a tough sport, and they don't get through it because we yelled at them. We they get through it in spite of us yelling at them, right? Because yeah. what I've learned is is when I start to tickle the brain a little bit, like. And just bring it to them in a way that makes sense. Like, hey, what are you up to? And just finding different ways to coach different kids. Man, what better results? I would 100% agree with you. Getting yelled at in my junior year was like kind of the last straw of why I like didn't wrestle. Your senior year? Yeah, my senior year. So pretty much it was a really big miscommunication. Um, the coach at the time had plans for me. He didn't want to tell me about, uh, for my senior year. And I had a lot going on at home. He knew about it, but he cared about my future more and didn't tell me about my future. So it was kind of a catch 22 for him because I was like, I need a break. I know it's my senior year, but my... Everything's not right. I need to focus on me. And he was like, you need to wrestle. And I was like, no. Like, doctors are telling me to stop everything except for school. Like, I'm not working. I'm not, like, school. Reset. Pretty much. Yeah. And he was like, you're throwing your whole life away. And that's what made me angry. Because a lot of teachers before told me I was going to accomplish nothing. And he had faith in me. And then all of a sudden, I'm throwing my life away to this guy I looked up to. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I- I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I walked out. Didn't talk to him for two to three years after. And then, well, we know what happened from there. No, we do. Yeah. But so, they don't. Yeah. But that's okay. But he passed away. He did. Yeah. Never got to clear it with him, right? No, I did. You did? Uh, well, not to that extent, but we were okay. Um, after I joined the military, we were in touch a little bit. He was. I reached out to him when I was in Illinois about opening up a wrestling clinic out in Illinois because the Air Force did an awful one. And then every place I went in Illinois, I got shut down. So I put that on the back burner. But we were, after, after I joined the military, we kind of, we reset and we were fine. And then it wasn't until he passed away when I found out about he had, like, people planning to come, like, see me wrestle for college and stuff. And even after that, I was kind of, like, a little annoyed because I told him I wasn't going to go to college. Um, at least not after high school. I was done with school. I was burnt out. Um, and so I was just like, I'm not doing it. I'm done. I'm going to take a break. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to be a 19 year old for a year and then see what happens. Mm -hmm. Ended up joining the military. But it was still kind of, it rained, it sat weird because I told him I didn't want to go to college and he was still going out of his way to like set all this up. And then it wasn't like until a couple months after is when I finally felt the appreciation for it. And it it was because I was still grieving that he that he passed. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how to process my feelings. And this is one of the ways that I started to step forward in learning about emotions and feelings. And as these guys hear all the time, I'm really big on mental health now. And like me and uh, Benji from the last episode, we talked about mental health for about 25 minutes in the mental health aspect of the military. Because that's where I learned it. Everybody thinks in the military... If you go to mental health, you get kicked out. And you don't. They, I mean, I got, I got out. But I asked because I wasn't fit for duty. I could have stayed in, 
but I didn't see it fair. So, that's where I am now. But wrestling and sports, they they gave me that motivation to be able to do what I did in the military. They gave me that mental strength that you do need. Because when I went through sports, I got yelled at. I got yelled at a lot because that was how it's... That's how we coached. Yeah, that's how, that's how we coached. Mm-hmm. And so... And for the record, the coaches, they're doing the very best that they know how oh, to yes. do. I guess my thing is... is could you learn something new? Just like you asked the kids to do? Yep. I digress. Well, so I was actually talking to my mom about this the other day because... I'm, Hi, Kelly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more open about all of this. And I was talking to her about how I've learned that they did the best that they did thinking how to do it. Mm-hmm. Because they were raised a certain way and they were like, I'm going to do better than this. And then they do what they think is better. Just like how me and my wife, if we have kids, we're going to do the same exact thing. And so, yes, you think that parents sometimes aren't doing their best and, like, they hate you. Or, like, some parents might. And if they do, I'm sorry. It happens. But for the most part, majority of the time, they're doing what they actually think is best. In, In that moment. In that moment. And it might be wrong. But you people can't really hold on to that. It's not... Well, what makes it right or wrong, though? Because if you're coming... Like, if a parent's coming from their place, like, this is, like, the best I got. I, th- I always think I'm doing the right thing. How's it wrong? So when you say that, I don't get... I don't mean... I th- Let me reward this then. Because okay. that made sense. Yeah, sure. So it's not... Right or wrong, but a lot of the times parents throw their kids' feelings on the back burner. How about what works and what doesn't work? Because some of the stuff that my parents did, it mm-hmm. worked. And there was some stuff, it just didn't work. Because I was different than when they were kids. And they had their experience. And so, go back to your high school thing with your coach, right? Mm-hmm. Like Knowing what you know now, how could he have supported you better? Like, if you... You could write it out the way you wish it would have happened. How? Because I, I, again, in my head, I make up like these are the things that we come to talk about. Because who can hear it and adjust to it, right? Who's a coach that can go? Oh shit, maybe I could do it that way. Give me more time. And what does that look like? Does he just ignore you, not call you? Because it's a very careful balance, right? Like, let's say I'm the coach, and and I know you got some stuff going on in your personal life. You know, mm-hmm. you suffered a, a tragic loss of a very young woman. Uh, your auntie, I believe, yes. right? And like that, that takes a toll. And, oh, it and, does. And time to heal through that is good. So, like, one of the things that as a coach that would support me is, is well, how can I support you? Like, what does that look like? Because if you don't know how to support you, how can you have me figure out? And, like, time. Human nature is to go isolate. I'm going to go figure it out, and when I'm done figuring out, then I'm going to come back. And what I've learned is, is, no, no, stay right here. And let's figure it out together. Like you, you're figuring it out. I'm just going to make sure you're not smashing your head against the wall, beating yourself up while you're doing. Makes sense. You know? And that's, that's kind of what I... So the assistant coach, this whole sequence of events, it's like burned into my memory. Of it, course. Oh, yeah. Well, there was so much... Between, like, just the negative emotion that comes from loss, and then the anger that followed, like, the couple days and week after, that had nothing to do, really, with the loss, but with just outside forces. So, it was January 7th. It was a Wednesday. We had a dual meet with Timberland. I wasn't there because I was in the hospital saying goodbye to my aunt. I I said bye, and I was talking to Jason the whole day. And I felt the need to go vessel because that was my outlet. Mm -hmm. My mom said no. Jason said yes because he was like, this is your outlet. If you need to, it's here. Mm -hmm. 
So I didn't end up going. And then I went to practice the next day. The assistant coach told me to leave. He didn't see I was right. And I was like, no, I'm good. I can wrestle. Like, I want to be here. And so this one of my teammates, he was two or three weight classes up. And he was like, I'll wrestle him. What is he going to do to me? Like, I outweigh him. I'll just sit on him. And I was like, okay, deal. Let's try this. And so I was getting too rough. I was... Yeah, you not. were taking it out on people, not wrestling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so this assistant coach looked at me. He was like, you want to do this? We're going to do this. You're not going to hurt a student. And I was like, okay, cool. So we cleared the mats, and it was just me and him. And we went at it for, I think it was about six minutes. Just a six-minute live wrestle. Right. Yeah. And we only stopped it because... I was getting too rough for him. And then he kicked me out. That didn't go over too well. Because he was angry. And like he was yelling at me. So I took it the wrong way. But I understand the whole situation. I was wrong. I shouldn't have been there. That was... Well, is it is it possible... Not that you were wrong. But the situation, how you both handled it. Wasn't right. It, I don't know that it would have created what you like what you want to create in that moment, right? Yeah, like, and that's the thing is is like in those in those moments for me because my coping skills were violence. Yeah, and I've shifted. <laughs> I feel much better now, but like it took me a while to get there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like, what could you have? Like, it's about ownership, right? Like, yep, the coach we could definitely pinpoint him and figure out like what what he could have done different, but. Like, the growth for me is always in is, like, how could I have shown up different to create what I what I say I want to create? So, like, before I go to practices, like, I think about, like, what do I want to create tonight? When I go into this room and there's 50 kids and they're in there, I don't know what their day entailed. I don't know if somebody's got their mom is sick, you know, battling cancer or you know, nowadays COVID, whatever it is. Whatever's going on in somebody's life. What do I want to create for that kid? What do I want to create for the kid who, life's good. He's just grinding hard. He's a stud athlete. Works his butt off. You know, he studies. Like, everything just on the outside seems, like, perfect for that kid. What do I, how, do I, how do I take that spectrum of kids in a practice room and create a great night for all of them so when they leave there, they love wrestling, and more importantly, they feel settled any aggression, any fatigue, whatever whatever it is for that individual. How do I get them to be in a better space than when they got here? And that's, that's always like, how do I bring that into situations? So like, knowing that, going backwards, what could you have done different? Not gone at it at a violent way, most definitely. So if you're not being violent, what are you being? Passive. Talking about it. Peaceful. Peaceful. Right? Yeah. And that may have created something different. 100%. Yeah. Right. So, that, and again, not from a, a space of bad and wrong. It didn't serve you. No. Nope. Not that it was wrong. It didn't serve you because it still sits in you a little bit. So, how do you, how do you shift it even just a little bit more to understand like your role in it? And then take that and down the road. I'm confident someday you'll you'll be in a coaching position somehow somewhere, and you take that, and that's, yeah. those those questions are things that you ask yourself before you go into a practice, before you're running your team's practice and going, what do I want to create for these kids tonight, or the, you know these these young men and women in high school, whatever level that you're on, like that's the question you get to ask yourself, like, are you just collecting a check? There's not much money in coaching nope. wrestling or anything else on the U love. You do it because you love it. If there's money at all, right? Like Merrimack uh, Youth is a paid pro paid position, but most oh. positions volunteer. I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, like Rick Ross at the Y. Mm -hmm. It was paid, but he worked for the Y, so it was just part of his salary. Okay. Yeah. And then after that, they like they paid me for like a year, and I'm like, 
I feel like I'm stealing money. Like I love this stuff. Like I would pay you to come here and be able to use it. <laughs> and and then like went to Empal and Empal is a completely free program, so no coaches get anything. It's all volunteer. That's amazing. I like volunteer stuff more than paid gigs. I mean, it's nice getting paid, yeah, but both got a perk. Oh yes, but personally, I feel volunteer is more. People are there for more the right reason. Some people volunteer because they get assigned community service from a guy That's in a true. nice robe. That's true. <laughs> I will. I hear what you're saying. So what yeah. you're saying is, is you want to come from the most honorable space when you're in service to somebody. Yeah. And the way you see that is to offer the services for free. It doesn't. So I know you get what you pay for, but yes and no. Mm-hmm. So like with products, you get what you pay for. Depends who you're working with. Cause, Cause, nobody paid me for anything. That's true. And I think they got good quality coaching. You were one of my favorite coaches, wow. so I will say that. So, and it was completely free. Yeah. Well, as far as I don't, yeah, the white program was free, right? Well, Rick Ross was there. He was he got a, like a stipend for wrestling. Yeah. And when he left, and I took over as head coach for a year before we moved or two, yeah, they, they paid you something. Again. Minimal, and quite honestly, that money goes back into the program. The end of the year, banquet. Yeah. You know, like, when I got to the program, the program had six or seven coaches. When I left, we had six or seven coaches. Like, that volunteer, a lot of time. So, we're going to get them something, whether it be jackets or Mm -hmm. something like that. And we do fundraising. Like, I'm not at the Y coaching so I could pay my light bill. Like, I'm, a, I'm blessed. I don't say yeah. that. You're like, I'm blessed. I don't need that money. Like, my yeah. day job handles it. So I can just do it because I like it. I believe in what the sport offers. And that's what I like more than, like, people wanting to get paid because of it. Because if you have that payment aspect in it, you have that people who would just be like, oh, it's a coaching gig. I can coach. I need the extra cash. Mm-hmm. There are some people like that. Yep. There are some people not. But the whole having a, a volunteer present coach is, to me, more meaningful in a way. Because it feels like they want to be there more. They actually like the sport. And it... that Well, actually, those are pretty much the only two reasons. Yeah. Now that I think about it. Well, when you, like, So think about it like this, right? Both of us are in the military. Yep. Um, in the civilian world, oh, you have a uniform on. You're doing your service for a country. Thank you for your service, right? Yeah. Until you go out in town in one of those military, like from a military base, you go into those towns. Not The locals don't always like you. Oh, no. 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 You know why? Because not everybody with a uniform on is a good guy. Mm-hmm. I don't care what uniform it is. Military, firefighter, EMT, wrestling, football, none of it. It's what's in here that's going to make you a good person or not. Yep. And so, you know. And it's crazy because when I joined the military, I knew not everybody is good, but the amount of cri- criminal, yeah, criminals, the amount of criminals I've saw, I saw, like from following all these different military pages that were in the military, it was baffling. I saw everything from child predators to just. People who just murdered their family. It's society. Oh, just yeah. Just because it's the military. People, it's, na- uh, it's not nature. It's, it's society, like you said. Whatever happens in the civilian world can happen in the military. And, and vice versa. And vice versa. Yeah. And when I first joined, I didn't really think that because I thought, you know, I was the new, I was green, the new guy. As they say, they were green. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, oh, everybody here is going to be like, a decent person. No, every it's it's life. It's normal life. I it was a rude awakening fast, and I mean, it wasn't a rude awakening. It was more like a kick in the ass. It was a uh, all right, dreaming's over. Mm. Like you know what real world is. You Eye worked opening. in yeah. So it was just like all right, back to the day to day. But and for, in like basic that that's where it was for like the first two weeks of basic. Besides of getting yelled at by the MTIs, but I knew that was their job. So I was just like, oh, everybody here is pretty cool. Like, everybody in the military must be pretty decent people. 
after the third week, everything kind of just skyrocketed with a few people. Mm-hmm. And I was like, all right, scumbags can be in the military too. Oh, yeah. This is sweet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It yeah. was it was fun. I remember uh, so when I went to boot camp, it was a, uh, I don't know about you, but boot camp from a physical perspective was easy. Yes, like so easy. And I was in the Marine Corps, thirteen weeks. It's like, but it was easy because like we had to go do training and stuff. They couldn't just beat your ass all day and run you and throw dirt. You still got to yeah. go to the rifle range. You still got to go work on your orienteering. Like, all this other stuff that they got to teach you. So like, all right, you want to beat me up for two hours? I'm all right with that. That was my favorite. So the classroom stuff that we did, super boring, super dry. Most of it was death by PowerPoint. It was <laughs> when I make PowerPoints for school. Um, I am in college now. But yeah, I, I did decide to do that. Thank you, Uncle but, Sam. <laughs> but when I make PowerPoints for school, um, in each PowerPoint I make, at the end of it, I put, I would not show my employees PowerPoints. And I do that because I sat through, we would have to get to this building at 9.30 in the morning. I would leave at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. From 9.30 to 4 o'clock, PowerPoint. I hate PowerPoints. It was invention ever. Yeah, Worst invention. I don't know why. Like, well, It's just like anything, Tom. Too much of anything is not a good thing. So death by PowerPoint in one day, I get it. Yeah, it ruined me. So I don't show PowerPoints to... Do you still use Word documents? Or... Oh, yeah. I don't know if you hated the whole Microsoft. No, suite. no, just PowerPoint. <laughs> just PowerPoint. But, and I don't, I'm not even good at making PowerPoints. So when I make these PowerPoints for school, I'm so happy they have, like if I want to add an image, I just drag and drop it. And it's like, oh, it would look good here. I'm like, oh, sweet. Click. Now imagine if that same program every time you wanted that was like, "Hey, stupid! You could put it over here. What are you, a moron? <laughs> How long would you use that application?" Oh, not long. Maybe for the first couple minutes, you'd be like, "That's so funny, ha ha ha!" Yeah. Like I can't believe he just said that to me. And after a while, guess what? You'd put it on mute. Mm-hmm. You would turn something off, and that's what's happening with our with our student athletes. It's not just in wrestling. Yeah. That's like it's everywhere. Like and. When I take a step back, it's just in our communities. Like, I've seen enough parents at a wrestling gig, the way they talk to each other, the way they talk to coaches, the way they talk to referees. I was at a lacrosse game this year, and there was somebody in the stands just like yelling some of the most vulgar things that I'd ever heard at a high school game. And I, I literally watched people around this person like shrink down. Like, as to not be associated with that kind of... Yeah. It was just like... Like, we talk about, oh, nobody wants to volunteer. We can't find anybody to help out. Like... Look how you treat these people. There's a lot of that. And I started reffing... Um, was it last year or the year before? Two years ago, I think, now. Um, wow. <laughs> like, just other side, right? Like, so I'm not sitting in the corner as a coach... I'm on the mat, and you know, my first year I did a lot of shadow, especially with Rick. You know, he's out there a lot, and I was just shadowing him. And so I'm able to like observe as a referee, but not have to be making the critical calls and yeah. doing the hand gestures. And so I had the time to just like observe the environment as it was going on. And man, it looks like a place for mental patients. And then I watch like some of the higher level, like the seniors, uh, the world championships were this past weekend. And they have one coach in the corner, mm-hmm. and there's volume, but they're not losing their minds. Oh, yeah. They're like, instructions, and one thing that I picked up pretty quick was, stop being a video game controlling coach. Like, I don't need to do AAA, BBB, X, Y, Y, none of that. Like, tell the kids what they need to do, and let them flow a little bit. Let them figure out, like, it's like me riding, like, they're riding their bike, and I'm right behind them the whole time holding their handlebars. Like, nope, turn left. No, no, turn right. So it's funny that you say that because as a wrestler, I never fully understood why gyms were so loud. Like, I get it because everybody's yelling so you can hear them. But <laughs> even I've been in dual meets where it's completely silent and there's maybe one or two mats, but nobody's screaming because there's two people going at a time. Mm-hmm. 
And the assistant coach at the time, he knew how I liked to be talked to when I wrestled. Because when you have head gear on, you can't hear. Right. And so it was always short, sweet, one, two words. Like moves, move names. Yeah. And it wasn't even just... If more people thought like that, just let the coaches coach. And if coaches didn't sit there and scream because they think if they scream louder, the wrestlers are going to do what they want them to do. Mm Mm-hmm then gyms wouldn't be that bad on Sundays. It it wouldn't you wouldn't be leaving with a headache. Wrestlers wouldn't be feeling so defeated. Because it's not only because some people think you step out on the mat, you're just wrestling the other person across from you. You're wrestling the time, you're wrestling the ref, you're wrestling your coach, you're wrestling the other person's coach. Like there's so many different factors into this because not only are you focusing on the wrestler you're focusing on your coach. You're focusing on the time. You're focusing on the ref. And if a wrestler says they don't focus on the other coach, they're lying. No, no, they do. Because I oh. know as a youth coach, we're like, hey, we're over here. And they're just, it's like they're watching a movie. And it's the other coach and the other kid. Mm-hmm. Like, and, okay. well, even in high school, I listened to the other coach. I listened to the other coach more than my coach. Because I didn't care what my coach said. I knew what I wanted to do. I want to know what the other coach was telling the other kid what to do. Because most kids, when I was in high school, didn't wrestle for 13 years. So they were listening to their coach. And my coach was over there screaming, stand up, stand, like, stand up. I'm like, no, sit out, sit out, sit out. Like, you taught me that. Yeah. I remember for like one or two weeks in eighth grade, I didn't have a partner. And you were just like, pick a move, practice. It. And so I sat there and just did sit-outs for two two hours, two, three times a week because I didn't have a partner. And then high school came around and nobody could stop me. One or two people. Right. Well, and, yeah, move, yeah, counter, move. Yeah, move. And it was, it was hilarious because coaches would be like, he's going to sit out. And I would even nod. I'm like, yeah, I'm it's going coming. to. Yeah. And maybe the first one wouldn't get it, but the second one, one or two. Always, unless if it was somebody from Timberlane, or I mean, yeah, there's there's some yeah. tough kids in the state that yeah. you know, hey, you might have to switch it up and go to a stand up or hit a mm-hmm. switch or, but like Jordan Burroughs, right, gold medalist, world champion, many times Basics. over, he's really the face face of wrestling at the moment. Yes, how did he get there? Basics. Double legs. Yep, he just set him up different. And there's a guy, one time state champion, one time state champion high school. I think he was. I think he was two time in in college. I Maybe, believe so. Two, one or two. But I mean, hey, one is great. But you know, everybody's like, oh, you only. Everybody's so caught up. Oh yeah, well, I won big red, or I I won low. Like, who gives a shit what you've won? The kids will figure out what they want to win, and they'll put the work in to do that. And yeah. none of that matters. And the coaches should know better. I will say, yeah, that that. Winning big tournaments weren't really all that great. Like, I didn't really care about winning. I wasn't... It was nice to win. Yeah. But every Sunday or Saturday, I got to spend in the gym with a bunch of guys I got super close with throughout my entire life. And I have memories, and I still have friendships that I still talk to people today. I moved halfway across the country, came back. And then people that I wrestled with moved all the way across the country, and we still talk. Of course. And so it just builds these friendships that we went completely different paths, but we're still we're still talking. Still connected. Yep. It's, listen, don't get me wrong. Like, I, again, I love to win tournaments when I was in high school. It was like, it was a big deal. And then you know what? Then it's over. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, I did all that. And like, it's literally like, what? All the time considered, right? Like right after the match and the tournament, let's call it two hours. You know, like that time. And then, hey, you go out to dinner. Hey, he won the tournament and all that. Ah, and then it's over. Yeah. The next day, you're back on the grind. Mm Because there's another tournament the next week. And that's that's the life of a wrestler, right? Like individual tournaments like that. 
right? Like if you play college football, everybody plays on Saturday, right? Oh, the quarterback had a terrible game. That's why we did. He threw five picks. That's why we lost. Yeah. There's no room to hide like that as a wrestler. You're on the mat, and it's either you. And I love when people are like, oh, the, the ref did this, or the, that it was too close. And that was the thing, like, my coach was, like, he wanted me to win. He wanted us all to win. He was competitive. I mean, who doesn't want the wrestler to win? All right. But he, uh, there's a few times where I don't, because I think that there's a greater lesson in the long run for that kid to lose. So, I mean, again, that's as, the, as I've gotten older and wiser. And further away from that competitive, like everything's got to be win or lose. Yeah. So that, like, there's a place for winning and losing. I'm not, I'm not afraid of that. What it is 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 like the importance of it, right? We're not at the Olympics. We're in no. high school. Most like it's less than five percent. I think it's like less than three percent. But I'll go big. Less than five percent of kids who play sports in high school make it to any kind of college sport. Any kind of college sport, less than five percent. Yet, probably sixty percent of people that I come across think their their kids going to school on a scholarship. And then we see them get there, and by the time they get there, you know what they are burnt out. Mm-hmm. You know why? Because they've been traveling the East Coast since they were fuck eight years old. And why? Like, there's some kids that that's what the future is for them. Got it. Most of them are not. So let's build a sport for them. And the other ones, they'll find their tournaments. They'll find their hammer shacks to go to. That's that's one thing I'm happy my parents did for me. Um, they taught me how to keep certain aspects of my life. Make sure that's still recording. Um, keep certain aspect, aspects of my life on a certain percentage so you don't get burnt out. So for wrestling, up until... Sixth grade, middle school, they were like, we're only wrestling during wrestling season. You're not wrestling off season. Mm -hmm. If you want to play football during off season, play football. But you're not wrestling. Sixth grade rolled around and they asked me. They're like, do you want to? I was like, no. Like, why would I? I'm I'm playing football. Right. And then that habit. Yeah. And then seventh grade, I was like, I want to go. To Ohio in eighth grade, so that's when that's when I met Jason, mm-hmm. and he was at the training station uh, for the Griffins, and I I think I still have that singlet. <laughs> yeah, I have I have all my singlets. Sorry, Rick. Uh, even, I think he knows. Oh yeah, your mom was in charge of them. <laughs> but well, he asked me for them, and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Sentimental. It's yeah. There's not there's not many things that I keep. But I have a bag in there that I don't open because it smells bad. Because it can't not smell bad. I don't know why. Everything in it's clean. It just leaks. It's a wrestling bag. Oh, yeah. yeah. And all of my singlets in it. Put it um, in the freezer. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah? Yeah, it kills it. Take your shoes. You got stinky shoes. Freezer. Hmm. Little life hack for you. Interesting. But I actually use my wrestling shoes now from high school to lift in. Because they're flat, they're comfortable. Yeah. Um, but with taking short breaks for wrestling, I didn't get burnt out. And then I got to choose when I did more. Mm-hmm. And it was only for 7th and 8th grade I did four-year wrestling while doing football. I was a busy kid. Yeah, you did some practices at the training station. I was I wanted to be more prepared for high school. Yeah. I had big shoes to fill in my in my in your childhood mind. Your, mind. your bigger brother, right? Yeah. yeah. So shout out to Billy. <laughs> so I was. I thought I had big shoes to fill, and I wanted to fill them. It, everybody in my family, pretty much, well, all my siblings went to Central except for one of my sisters, but it was our alumni and so i was like you took pride yeah in your tribe. i was growing up i was super excited to wrestle for wrestle for to wrestle for central and it was i remember my first du- my first dual meet it was like a dream come true i was wearing the green singlet i was wrestling on the indian head it was it was amazing and if i remember correctly i lost <laughs> well. but after that i didn't 
my freshman year, I won uh, Rookie of the Year. And then I think every year, I didn't get anything my junior year because that's when I, I stopped. But my freshman and sophomore year, they were amazing with wrestling. I didn't win anything big. I made it to... I placed fourth in state and then third at the meet of champions. And like... So you got to go to New England. Yeah, I got to go to New England. I don't think I placed. I I didn't even get close. Yeah. But like, I was just happy to be there. Mm -hmm. Like... Yeah. Again, uh, there's different levels of success, right? Oh, yeah. If we measured everybody like you have to be a New England champion, well, then a lot of us would be, myself included, we would be failures, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And I, it's, I just don't see it like that. You know, and again, I'm older now. It's not for, for a 15, 16-year-old who's going through puberty and getting all the testosterone and all of that stuff and, and gearing up for, like, the battle of life. Yeah. It's not for that person to know. But as a coach or a mentor who's been through it before, how do I get that message across to them so that they they hear it repeatedly so that they pick it up quicker? Because with that comes compassion, right? It, for, for me, it does. Right? Like The moment that I stop thinking like every kid's got to be a state champ and that there's just different wins, right? like, hey, one of, your, one of your teammates on Central, right? Cameron Varney. He's one of my favorite success stories. And maybe he was right, at, right after you. I don't know. He, he was like one, one or two years below me. So yeah, yeah. I mean, his thing. He came in in seventh grade. Him and his, him and his uh, cousin Joseph. <laughs> um, he came in and you know, Joseph was a little more naturally athletic, a little more yeah. naturally talented. Just kind of could move a little bit better. Knew his body better at that time. And Cameron was uh, like soft, roly poly soft. Mm-hmm. You know sweetheart good kid tried as hard as he could just didn't work he didn't win a single match his first year in seventh grade he came back Mm -hmm. how many kids come back and part of that is him he has it internally for him the other part is is like he had people behind him myself was one of them like one of his biggest cheerleaders and and my friend jason that it was always positive, man. Like, you're doing great, dude. Like, look at how far you've come. You were getting pinned in the first period all the time. You're scrapping it out. You're getting pinned in the third. That's like another two and a half minutes of wrestling. Before you know it, it's going to come. And he just kept working and working. And then came back in his eighth grade year. Puberty started to hit him a little bit more. Mm-hmm. You know, he's a little bit of a late bloomer in that sense. He was a big kid, but kind of soft still. So seventh grade was tough because he was battling kids that had hit it. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, eighth grade, gets a win. That's it's the, another win. I love seeing another. kids win for the foot. Like, I've seen kids wrestle for years and not win. And then as soon as they get that first win, it's not even the fact that they feel satisfied that they won. It's more of a, a accomplishment that how far that they have come. And a lot, a lot of kids can see it that, like, I started at this. And I actually, I actually won finally, and it it teaches certain kids at the time that hard work actually does pay off. And it teaches them all. Oh, some it takes longer than others. Well, they might but, not even get the lesson until they're older, but it's there. Oh yes, so it's and see that's it. that's one of the sad things about sports. You don't know you learned a lesson until later down the road. Well, it's life. Oh, yes. Right? People in prison are like, Oop, I'm going to learn this lesson. <laughs> yep, okay. Right? It happens. Like, some of us learn the hard way. Listen, I'll be quite honest. I'm lucky to have lived the life that I live. It could have been a very different life if the universe did something different, right? So I'm not, yeah. I'm not a God person. We'll call it the universe. Because all I did was just happen to be born on this patch of dirt. Like, I didn't do anything to get anything that I have right now. I just showed up here. So for me... How I see it, it's it's like my duty. It's like it's my purpose to live the best life that I can live and be in service to people around me. Cause I didn't do shit to be here. Like, what did I do? I just happened to be born in like one of the greatest countries, if not the greatest country on earth. 
that's got its problems. Don't get me wrong. We all got problems because they're <laughs> run by humans and we ain't perfect. Yeah. But man, do you know all I got to do is roll my trash out to the, to the curb and somebody picks it up and I, I don't even think about it again. It's just gone. Like just that. First world First world problems, right? Yeah, first world. I don't want to call that a plumbing. problem, but well, like, like those, those are perks. Yeah, like that's that's what I'm saying. Like when I'm getting down on some things about what's important and what's not important, I think about like how good we have it here as a whole. And again, nothing's perfect, but man, most people as a whole, they're not wanting for food, water, shelter. We got some people that we're still working to figure out how to best suit them up with the basics, but most of them got it. Like, when we're talking about kids on this, man, we got people that will support other people. Nobody cares about my record no. when I wrestled. Nobody. My family, the kids in, in my life that I've coached before, they don't care about any of it. And they all benefit from the lessons of me being an athlete, whether it was wrestling, baseball, football, lacrosse, anything I ever tried, all of those were lessons. Just like the Marine Corps. Just like I played the flute. Like there's lessons in everything we do. What we like, what we don't like. I played the flute. For like three weeks. And then I was like, listen. Was it school? I want... Yeah, my mom was like, you got to try an instrument. I'm like, are you nuts? Like I got practice. Because I wasn't, for me it was always be outdoors. Banging around. Doing, yeah. doing like fun stuff outdoors. I remember like after school I'm like, what am I doing? And now I'm taking up guitar. <laughs> I see it. So... I haven't played in a while. I'm not going to lie. I haven't. Um, I do have this game. It's called Locksmith. And it's pretty much just like a dog band. But you use a real guitar. I plug it into my PlayStation. And the chords pop up on the screen. And it looks just like GarageBand. No kidding, huh? And so it just has like a square on the note. And it pulls up. And when you're supposed to hit it, you hit it. Guitar and, for dummies. Yeah, it's... And, like, you can... They have thousands of songs you can download. You can learn any song... Almost any song you want. It's crazy. Um, I was good at Drops of Jupiter. There's, like, four notes. It's easiest song ever. I'm gonna go learn it. <laughs> I'm gonna go learn it. Because I, I ain't got no songs under my belt. I got yeah. some chords and some strumming patterns. That's about it. Drops of Jupiter. It's the same... Three, four chords over and over again. It's all about timing. Oh, yeah. It's easy. But I used to know how to play the piano. I used to be good at it. Um, middle school, they were like, my, the we were learning flutes and because you always learn flutes. Yeah. I don't the know. Recorder. Why. Yeah, recorder. The recorder. They're, they're like 35 cents. They're yep. cheap. Cheap wood. Boop, 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 boop. There you go. <laughs> nope, not for you. Go back and play sports. Yeah. But I was interested in the piano and my teacher would like teach me how to play the piano and I got okay at it and then I heard the saxophone and I really wanted to play the saxophone and my brother had one and he wasn't using it so I was like hey can I use it for the band and he's like yeah and then I wasn't good but I I learned how to read music at the time I forget now it's been forever of course but, and then one day I went to go get it and it was gone. And he's like, oh yeah, I sold it. <laughs> and I was, I was mad. But then he was like, well, it was mine. And I was like, well, you're like. Kind of got a point. Yeah. And it's like yelling at your parents. What do you mean you sold the house? Yeah. It's, house. it's like, it's, it's my house. It's like, okay, you got a point. I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to like that you're right. Yeah. So, but then... In high school, in music class, I would just sit there and play the piano, and I kind of wish I kept with it, but pianos are expensive, like even like cheapish Keyboards. Pianos. Yeah. Yourself some keyboards. But I want to learn how to play guitar, and... A wrestling band coming to you soon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like talking to people a little bit more than playing instruments. It's... Well, you do it better, I'm sure. Oh, <laughs> 100%. I'm way better at talking than I am playing the guitar. Oh, well, practice. That's all it takes. That's it, man. Yeah. So, I've... you know the, the phrase, there's, I listened to a good TED Talk um, a couple of weeks back. And so, you know the phrase, like, 10,000 hours before you master something, right? Yep. Well, so, that statement 
is true. You know, like scientific study. Like they studied all sorts of people and they started like musicians, athletes, business people, like smart people, all of that. They studied them. And what they found out was like most of them had put in, in, the, in the neighborhood of like 10,000 hours to be where they're at. And what that does, like that's great. It's good to know. But what that does is that that holds people from actually taking a shot. Like, I ain't got 10,000 hours to do that. <laughs> who, who, like, who's going to put the kind of work that Eddie Van Halen put in to play the guitar? Somebody that really wants to play guitar. And how many of those are there out there? Eddie Van Halen? Yeah. And he ain't even here anymore. <laughs> but, like, what, how many hours does it take to be proficient at something? And the guy that was given the TED Talk, he came up with a number. 20 hours. If you dedicated 20 hours, like real 20 hours, most things you could, you could be sufficient at. And his thing was, and it made me nuts, he called it the ukulele, which is probably the correct pronunciation of the ukulele. So the ukulele. And he tracked it, and he did 20 hours. And in that 20 hours, he learned the chords to be able to play 95% of the songs that are in our existence. Because they're all some semblance of the same chords. Just a little different timing, a little different strumming pattern. And, oh and at the end of the TED Talk, he went through it. And he's like, so what did I learn from my 20 hours? And he just went through it. <laughs> and he just, he would go from song to song to song. And it all sounded the same, but just him just switching up the words and a little bit of timing and boom. 20 hours, he was a really proficient guitar player. To the, to the common ear, I'm sure musicians are like, ah, your timing's off or... But he, he wasn't looking to be the a greatest. rock star. Yeah. He just wanted to enjoy playing the ukulele. And I had a guitar for three years. My wife, she bought it for me. Because I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that goes out and buys things for myself. So she they, they chipped in. They got me it for like Christmas or something. Aww. And it sat in my, in my bedroom in its case for a long time. A long time. A long time. And like a lot of people through COVID, I'm like, well, I guess I got some time on my hands. <laughs> And so one of my brothers is uh, he's a good musician. So I reached out to him and I was like, "Hey, you give me some guitar lessons, cause like I want to play." And I've looked up, you know, hey, look on YouTube. I know it's different. But yeah, like if I told you, like, "Hey, oh, you want to wrestle? YouTube. Go to YouTube. Are you gonna do Greco, freestyle, or folk style? Do you want to learn top, bottom, or neutral first? Like, what kind of body type are you?" Because different body types can do different moves like mm -hmm. and style. So to just tell somebody, go look up wrestling on YouTube, they're going to get some WWE stuff. Next thing you know, somebody's on the Indian head smashing somebody with a chair. Yeah. You know? And so just it's a battle with myself, the guitar. I like to be good. I really like to be good at shit that I do. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not. I'm not as good as I want to be on the guitar, but you know what I am now? I'm, I'm good enough to have some fun with it. Okay. And I can use it as a way to relax a little bit. And like I can sit on my my bed and just strum something and just like practice a little something. Might not sound like anything to anybody else, but boy, I have fun. Acoustic? Yep. Nice. And every once in a while, I'll start playing and my wife or uh, her auntie who's staying with us, they start moving ahead and they're like and there's a few patterns that I'm doing and, and they're like yeah man that sounds real good I've been hearing you practice on that and like any good good human being we like to be acknowledged on how we're doing you know nobody's like oh you suck it's build them up right talk mm -hmm. good to plants and they grow well guess what same with us so what a challenge to be able to just take it back from trying to always be the best at something and just enjoy the the journey of learning how to play the guitar and that's been a, a real lesson for me because, man, I like to be good at stuff to the point where I become obsessed. So, I have that issue too. Yeah, most, most people that are that excel in sports, they have that because it's like the repetition. I, like, I just want to be better at it. Like, oh, you screw that move up. Do it again. You drop the pass. When you run the pattern, instead of hooking it like this, hard out. Do it again. And you do it again. You learn... That's the beauty of the sports, man, is, is like, you're always being told to do it again, that it wasn't good enough. And that can come in, in good and bad, right? Nothing's ever good enough is not good. Yeah. 
and as coaches, how can we get the muscle memory? Like, man, that was beautiful. And it could be, what more could it be? Instead of, uh, it sucked, because you got 98% of it right. It's just that 2% that really matters to make the separation from a receiver and a D-back or to finish that double leg or that in inside trip. Whatever it is, hit the layup, the dunk, the three-point shot, whatever your sport is. It's that last 2% of focus and preparation and commitment that will get you there. So, repetition is one of the biggest things when it comes to getting good at something. And it's not always, you don't always need a reason to redo something. So, when it comes to sports, for instance, um, you don't, if a coach is like, redo it, it's not necessarily the player's job to argue with the coach. Like, the coach has reasons why he wants you to redo it. And nine times out of ten, it's because repetition. And, like you said, oh, it was the last 2% that everything else was good. But finish it better. Mm -hmm. And I remember we would, we would do sprints. And it's not because he wanted us to run more. He would do it until the last person would actually sprint through the finish. And we weren't just sitting there back, forth, back, forth. Back. Like, we would run down. He'd give us, like, a minute to catch our breath, like, breathe. And then if people jog, we do it again. Mm -hmm. And it's just they want you to finish it. They want you to 100%. Be your word. It. Yes. When you join the team, you agreed to do the things that it takes to be a wrestler. And part of that is to sprint, not jog, mm -hmm. not sprint three quarters of the way, sprint. Now, that being said, we all know like the body and the mind, it breaks down oh, and yes. it quits and we sell out on ourselves and all that. And that's okay because that's where the growth is, is selling out on yourself and coming up short and going, mm, nope, let me do it again. We, we as coaches as a whole, we come from punishment always. I see it all the time. We come from punishment. Oh, you guys don't want to work hard today. So we're going to run. Man, shut up. They're working hard. You just want more from them. Yeah. So instead of beating them down, telling them they ain't shit, that they're slow, that they're jogging, instead of teaching them all that, how do you inspire them to want to give more? Not motivate them inspire them there's a big difference because somebody who's inspired is motivated yeah you, you can't be motivated unless you're inspired to to be something that's what has people that are tremendous athletes they're inspired to be their best so they're motivated to get up in the morning and go for that run while everybody else is sleeping they're motivated to manage what they're eating so that they're not cutting weight to a point where it affects performance they're committed the whole way and what would it be like if we had more coaches that could pull that commitment out without hitting people over the head all the time and how shitty they are? So I feel like this isn't a sports problem. This is a society problem. Fair because statement. I, like I said before, I had teachers that were telling me I wasn't going to succeed. It might have been tough love, but I 100... That's not tough love. That is a jerk off of a teacher. Like, because that's, it. I'm sorry, yeah. it, it's yeah. not a good teacher. That's somebody that shouldn't even be close to, to kids or any kind of leadership position. Like, go do something else where your shitty negative attitude doesn't affect anybody but you. Yeah, I never understood why we had like teachers that were so terrible to students. And, like, I get it, they were teachers, it was their job, like, to be teachers. Yeah, well, but, like the military. Well, yeah, but like you don't have kids don't go to school to get yelled at. Kids don't go to school to be talked down to. They go to school to learn. And this is one of the reasons why I've learned young. I didn't like school, and it was it wasn't because of school itself, but it was because of the structure of school. It wasn't it wasn't creative. I was told color in the lines. Do what you're told. 
write what I tell you to write. Mm-hmm. Don't be creative. It was it's obey. It's not really yeah. learn. And I I got I changed up a writing assignment in in like sixth grade, and the teacher wouldn't accept it because I didn't write it the way that she wanted it wrote. Even though it was a free, it was like a whole free write, and she was just like, "I don't like this. Redo it." And I was like, "But it's a free write. Like, it's a type of writing. It's free, and oh, there's a story. Here you go." And I didn't get graded on it because she didn't accept it. Mm-hmm. And even in even in high school, I had teachers that would just shut up and color. You. You don't really ask questions. Here's a packet. Do your work. Yeah. And it, it's it's terrible to see these like kids go through these schools that like I went to, knowing they're still doing this. And only at every school. Oh yeah. Regardless of whether you're paying for it or not. And it, it it's weird that teachers would much rather go to the school every day and be a dick to a student. Well, so I want you to be careful there, because you say teachers. You're grouping a whole group of people based on your experience. Bad teachers. Well, there's there's right. individuals that are showing up. And here's the other thing, right? Compassion, right? Yeah. So, like, I don't think that they want to yell at kids. I just don't think they know anything different. Because guess okay. what? They probably got yelled at, too. And they figured, well, it worked for me. Look at me. I went to college. I'm a teacher. So, it works. They're doing what they think is best. In that moment. They know. Yeah. Right. And what I'm saying is... is so when we get out of high school, right, like most people, they don't go to the military, they don't go to college, right? They just go into the job force. Yeah. And become baby adults at 18, zero years old, and they are now ready to take on the world, right? They don't know shit about the world yet. Nope. You know, like, so what does it look like when we take those kids and we expect things from them that they're not capable of yet? And on top of that, when we get past that age, who coaches people? Like, in high school, I became the wrestler I was because I just surrendered and I listened to what my coach said. For whatever reason. Whether it was because I wanted to be the best and his authority just that's, it just rang for me. Whatever it was, however he coached me, it resonated with me in a way that was successful for me. And... I look back and I go, well, what else could he have done besides a lot of the things that he did do to get the same results? Yeah. And back then, different, right? But what I'm saying is, is like evolution. Why are we still doing it that way? Like the kids that are coming up today, they're not like me. They're not like a lot of the people that I knew back then. It's a different world than it was 35 years ago. So how do we, how do we approach it in a way that has t te- like? If I got a bunch of the teachers together in a, in a workshop and I, and I started asking them questions and asking them to look at themselves, would they do it? Would they, would they be open to like, hey, so I observed some of your classes and this is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing you yell at people. I'm seeing you get frustrated. I'm seeing you get this. I'm seeing you get that. What would it look like if they could channel the natural reactions of the human ego and then come from the heart and go, I'm here to teach, man. Like, so what's it? And, and on the other side of that, what would it look like for parents to send kids to school that were ready to learn? So what do you, well, to answer your first question, I do not think people would go to a workshop. Most people won't go to a workshop and voluntarily look at themselves and fix themselves. Um, How about not fix? Because fix would imply broken. Oh, How about improve? improve? There we go. Improve. Because language matters to yes. me. Yes. So I don't, I don't think a lot of people would go improve themselves. Because a lot of people don't think they need to be improved. And from my experiences that I've gone through the last couple of years, everybody has room for improvement. And that's, that's what life's about. Is all about improving, and if if we don't improve, we don't we don't learn anything new, we don't advance as humans, and we we would still pretty much be in the Stone Age, and in 
improving makes everything better. For example, these mics. It, before I didn't have mics, I was just yelling at my phone. Yep. I had one mic. I sounded better. Then I had people on. One mic wasn't all that great. I got another mic. Improvement. I'm learning. Yeah. And, Trying different things. And that's that's what we have to do. We have to try different things, and a lot of people are afraid to. Hmm. It took me... I had this mic sitting in my basement for about four or five epi- episodes. This is the first time I'm using it on because I didn't feel comfortable using it until now. But I finally figured it out, and I'm going to use it more. So what... What made you more comfortable to pull it out tonight? I learned how to use the software. So muscle memory, reps, getting in, mm-hmm. screwing some things up. You're like, oh, yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> Feedback, like all of the things that go through a sound check. Yep. Well, in the, in the sound check of life, a lot of people don't do that. You know, like, if, if I could get, like, all of the wrestling coaches in the state together, right? Like, yeah. Let's say that I could just somehow rope them all into a room. How many of those guys would be open to what I have to say that could support them in a couple of things, right? Growing their program numbers. Because the number one complaint, I, or the two complaints that I hear the most from coaches are, these kids today, they don't want to work hard, which is such horse shit. Yeah. And then the other one is, I'm having trouble getting numbers. And since I've been a coach, the last problem that I've ever had is numbers. Why? inspiration well people want to be where i'm at and not just the kids like coaches like i've always had at least six coaches they stayed with me wherever i went when when the why was like kind of phasing wrestling out and i was seeing it wasn't gonna work Mm -hmm. i let the why know like hey i'm gonna move on and i let the team know like hey this is gonna be my last season next year i'm gonna find another place to go and i'm gonna do some work and i ended up going over to mpal there's no wrestling at the why anymore Yeah. The whole program came with me. It wasn't because I'm the greatest wrestling coach at all. Because I'm not. Like, I got some decent technique at best. You know what it is, though? I know how to work hard. And most importantly, parents love what I coach their kids into. And it's not just wrestling. It's believing in themselves. And not just, like, because they wrestled, but it's because of the words that I'm saying to them. Because I've worked on my language and how I show up to these kids and what words come out of my mouth. And as I, as I stay in the community and I, I listen to it, and I'm coming from a space of like what's working, what's not working. So if you're not getting numbers in your program, what's not working? And there's only one answer for me for that question. What you're doing is not enrolling people into your program. That's it. Because if you're a coach, your job is to enroll people to your vision for the sport. So if you coach wrestling, how do you get the people out there to believe in wrestling the way that you do that as you coach? How do I get people? I'll speak from me, right? Magic gift. Always say I. So how do I enroll people into believing in what I'm doing on a wrestling mat? And so what it is is... Like, I enroll them into what my vision is. I just have a good vision. Like, I just want kids to use the sport as a way to be the best human they can be. And that's that's my come from. I don't give a shit about any titles or what you win. The kids that want to win, I'll coach them just as hard as the kids that are showing up. Period. End of story. Because those kids are going to get their best and their most out of it just as well. And you know what? A lot of times, the kids that are winning... They get, they get left alone a lot because, well, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Like everybody gets to have it. And so if you're having problems with your, with your numbers and your programs, look in the mirror. Like, that's, that's you. That has nothing to do with the kids of today. They don't want to work hard. None of that. You're just not reaching them. Like that, that's that's the issue with the, with the adults. Every generation. Humans. Hum- yeah. As one generation grows up, the, the kids... They they will like different things, still have different interests. And so pretty much what would be going on is these coaches would sit there and think that they're doing what their coach did because they think it got to them because, look, look like you said, look how they turned out. All right. But 
As a kid, I didn't want to be a scream dad. I love the way you talk to people. It, it's amazing. I in just one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on my show, and it was how do I word this? I was thinking too fast. <laughs> so the way that you talk to people, it's it's enlightening. I'll, I'll say that. A lot of people don't have the kindness that you bring. Everybody is always uptight and stiff. And for example, me and Emily, we ran into a complete stranger grocery shopping yesterday. He was from Texas. And I I forget how the whole conversation started, but I think he said, excuse me. And just his Southern hospitality. It was, it was refreshing because being, we went to the Midwest, we'd walk into grocery stores talking and people would just interrupt us and just join our conversation Mm -hmm. because it's the Midwest. Everybody is super nice out there. You got a funny accent. Where are you from? Yep. Yep. And even when I went to uh, Wisconsin, everybody, I've been to like sports games in Boston completely different atmosphere. Oh, yeah. You're not getting beer cans thrown at you. Mm. So I went to I went to Lambeau Field and we accidentally sat in the wrong seats. But it was negative three degrees out. Everybody was freezing. <laughs> we're sitting there like this. And we were supposed to be sitting one or two rows down. But there was nobody sitting there either. But we didn't care because we were all freezing. And yeah, we were keeping each survive. other warm. Yeah. Frozen tundra. Yeah, it was in seeing this talking to this guy from Texas, it was just so refreshing because I can't remember the last time I talked to a stranger in a store because they said excuse me. And people in New England are so uptight. Um Manchester, New Hampshire was voted the number uh, number ten worst driving st- t- city in America. Yeah. So You know, but like, again, so for me, it's about being the source, right? Like, so if I want, my wife says it all the time, like you talk to everybody, wherever we go, because that's what I want. I want to be able to like, if I see you in a grocery store and not know you, I don't want to be able to talk. Why can't I talk to you? Like, we're not in the Serengeti watering hole. I'm not, you're not a hippo. I'm not a croc. We're not a bad (laughs) war. Like, how you doing? Like, what's going on? Somebody gave us a weird look, like, because... We made a statement about how people up here don't do this anymore. And he made a comment about how he was from Texas. So right there, if you're listening, you know that we don't know each other. Mm -hmm. And this person like gave me, like gave us, like can't believe you guys are talking to each other right now. And it's like, we, we lost something somewhere. And it's, I think it's because of technology. We, we lost that connection part of it of like yes before people were like sitting on the subway reading Mm -hmm. uh, newspapers and i remember i've seen articles about how new newspapers were ruining people so i mean every generation has something yeah people used to be on their papers yeah yeah hey leave me alone i'm reading the evening paper Mm it's no different than hey i'm playing angry birds go grab your tablet it's the same concept. And I guess that's my thing is, is like, everybody wants to be right about how shitty everything is. And I'm just looking around going, I don't see it like that. It's not shitty. But, and I also don't consume nine hours of Facebook a day or Instagram and the news. And like, because the news is not news. If it bleeds, it leads. They're just trying to get your, your eyeballs on it. That's why every storm we got to go buy, you know, cereal. <laughs> Everything's going to go to hell. We've been in snowstorms ever since I've been up here. Mm-hmm. Right? Born here, raised here, left here for a while, came back, still snows. We're People good. still panic. Yeah. We're, power might go out. You know, like, I guess what I would like to see, and, and I'm going to ask that we end it on this note very soon, because I got some other appointments yep. with the aforementioned Mr. Rick Ross. <laughs> um, like, can we get to a point as individuals and as a society where we don't need turmoil to be able to come together? You know, like... I hear people all the time, oh, 
I, I don't want to ever hear September 11th again, but I'll take September 12th all day. Because, you know, everybody came together and, and mm-hmm. I got it. Metaphorically speaking, like, why do we got to have like, shit go wrong so that we can be nice to each other? We shouldn't. We shouldn't need to. And it's because people, it's terrible. Like, I, I used to like the news, but then they started dividing us. And a lot of people, I don't know how a lot of people don't see it. Because if you watch CNN, for example, because they are... But here's the thing. It's a false statement in this sense. They're paid political advertisements. Right? Oh, yeah. They're on cable. You have to pay to watch it. Mm-hmm. If they would just change it from, hey, this is the news, to this is a paid... Because you're right. CNN, Fox. Mm-hmm. Same event. Totally different. Yeah. And people will buy it. And so people on the right will be screaming at people on the left because they were wrong. And people on the left will be screaming. And it's... If we had a free source news that people could actually get to for free, didn't have a political agenda because they're not getting paid, why would they have a side? They would be giving you the news. I feel like life would be so much better. It would be good. It's never been the case. No. Nope. Like people are like, oh, the, back in the day, Walter Cronkite. Nope. nope. They all have been mouthpieces of, of the government. Because if you don't tend to their story, they're not going to give you the access. It's just the way it goes, right? And so critical thinking. Yes. That's what I would love to see return. Just critical thinking. That would be nice. I think we'd all benefit from it. That, with a little bit of compassion, we could have a beautiful world, Thomas. We could. It, it, compassion, critical thinking, and if somebody would just, if people would just stop and just talk to each other. like That's compassion, my Well, brother. it's not even, like, I don't want to say you have to be, like, fully compassionate. Like, if I'm talking to somebody, do I exactly care fully about how their day is going if they like a random stranger no not exactly why not what would it take for you to care it's so it's not that I don't care well, then what is it? It, it there's always there's something I, I'm gonna say more important like it sounds wrong just speak free though like yeah like, alright something more important so like it, what so my so I don't like stop and talk to people because, one, I don't, I don't like being in stores. I don't like being around a large group of people. So the sooner I'm in and out of a store, the better. I am always more for a one-on-one conversation. Even at family parties, I don't stand in groups and talk to people. I don't... Could you? Possibly. I... Because well, here's yes, the thing. I'm, I'm going to say... Roll the tape back, and you know what you said? I don't know why, as a community, we're not talking to each other and, and, you know... Yeah. So you see how, like, you're kind of the source for that. Yeah. And so that... And that's what I'm talking about is, is like, the things that you desire, they get to start with you. So if you want to have a community that communicates, then you have to be part of that community that communicates. And I know that there's some social anxiety there and, you know, like, crowds and all that. I got it. And who do you get to be to shift? Where that doesn't control or take you away from your vision of communication in our society, right? Because like you see the value in it and yeah. being connected with people, and you struggle with it. So just like you would coach somebody through, like, yeah, hey, it's tough. And how do you push through to get to where you want to be? Because you want to be connected. You want to be communicative. You want to you want to give a shit about what that person's day is genuinely. And right now, there's just something in the way. So what do you get to shift to be the source for that? That That's... Something I have to figure out. Yeah. Is it something you got to figure out or do you just choose it? Like today, I'm going to walk into the store and I'm going to talk to somebody. No, I, I see what you mean. So... Like, ready? Try to pound me. No, you just did. Try yeah. to. You, there's no try. Right. You're either yeah. doing it or you're not. So when you go into the grocery store and you get in that anxiety about, you know what, I really don't like to be in these places, you're right if that's what you tell yourself. Yeah. What if you told yourself, like, I don't like to be through these places and 
I'm going in to talk to somebody. And you just made that commitment. Yeah. Because you're vision driven, not feelings driven. So I will say, I have been working on it. Um, ever since I did that sign holding with you, yeah. um, that that was amazing. That was I want to do it again for sure. Um, when it warms up. So when when I do see people now, I do kind of say hi to them. Um, like the other day, I didn't have to. I I was I was coming back from work from a building. I had to park like a block away, so I had my tool bag on my back. I had a nitrogen tank on my shoulder. And I was carrying, I think, a vacuum pump. Or, like, a, a shop vac. And this lady was having a hard time parking. And I'm standing there with everything yeah, on my shoulder. On telling her how to, like, turn the wheel so she can park. Mm-hmm. And she was like, I'm so bad at parking. I'm like, I can see that. You're good. You can stop going now. And then she would, like, slam on a brake because she wasn't paying attention. Mm-hmm. She almost hit the car behind her. Mm-hmm. She and, got it there? Huh? She got it parked? Yeah, she got it. It was straight, too. Sometimes it, was, it ain't pretty. Yeah, it was amazing. Get the job done. And that's the thing, like, even in that moment, right? Like, when you confirm that she's not good at parking. Oh, no, she said it. She, right? Yeah. I said, when you confirm it. Oh, yeah. How else could you have done it? Be like, no, you're doing great. Like, you're in the spot, we'll get you there. <laughs> right? Like, and again, well, just because it matters. Yeah. Right? Like, we all got enough shit piled on us. How could we inspire her to be like, no, you're doing a great job parking. You know how I know? Because nobody's dying. You're good. There's nothing crash. So you're getting the job done. It's just a comfort thing. It's like you going into the store and being comfortable to go, hey, how are you doing today? And being okay with somebody going, who the fuck are you talking to? Like, get away from me, you weirdo. I get a weirdo looks all the time. Yeah. A lot. It's okay. From family, friends, yeah. and strangers. I don't care. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna continue to be me, and what That's I know is, do. is where I'm at today, because I continue to put work in on myself. I'm just a better version of me. That's it. Not better than you. Not better than your wife. Not better than my wife. Not better than anybody. I'm just a better me. Well, I mean, we can we can end it on this. That's what life is. It's just trying to be a better version of yourself. That's that's, that's it, all brother. we're trying to do. Yes, sir. Every day, wake up, do better than what you did yesterday. Mm-hmm. So, on that note, do you want to promote anything you have, Ben's Den? Yeah, definitely. So, um, Ben's Den, it's on YouTube. So, uh, just look up Ben's Den, you'll find it out there. Um, anybody that, it's, it's wrestling-based mostly, so um, if you're interested in wrestling stuff here in New Hampshire, we got some of that. And, um, you know, thank you for having me on. It was a, an honor to come and be able to chat with you for a while. Appreciate it. A- anytime. I love having people on. You're one of my favorite companies to have. I, I love talking to you. Always a great conversation. Always. We'll do it again. Amazing. All right, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you like this video, make sure you like it. Subscribe. Um, all yeah, that good subscribe. Stuff. All that good yeah, yeah. stuff. You hear it in the beginning. All right, guys. Enjoy your evening. Ben, thank you again. Yes, sir. Thank love you. Love you guys. Thank you. Have a great night. Dope. <laughs>